expansive landscape of data science where Python commands data with finesse. And for some reason, SQL is constantly screaming. There lies an underappreciated art. The art of not coding. I beg your pardon? When writing code, we often find ourselves repeating simple instructions or writing those weird one-liners that do, what do they even do? Maybe it's a simple filter to trim your data, or maybe you're pivoting it to reshape its contents. In either case, the code for this can be quite simple, but the syntax often eludes us. Today, I wanna to offer you a way out. I wanna show you a better world, a world where writing boring code is just a memory of the past. What's up guys, my name is Gabe. I'm a developer advocate here at Hex, and welcome to another episode from our course on Hex Foundations. Now today, we're gonna to be talking about no-code transformation cells, and specifically, we are gonna be covering what in the world a no-code cell even is. Now, by the end of this, you guys will have a better understanding of using pivot and filters to accelerate your data workflow, even if you're an expert Python or SQL programmer or not. So let's go ahead and get started. A no-code cell refers to any cell where you can achieve the same or similar results by writing code without actually writing any code at all. For example, if I want to print off the first five rows of a data frame, the code version might look like this, and the no-code version might look more like this. A different process for the exact same result. So far, you've only seen four of the eight no-code cells that are available inside of Hex, which are charts, maps, table displays, and single value cells. And the ones we haven't seen are filters, pivot tables, write back cells, and the DBT semantic layer. However, the cells that we've seen so far were not intended to alter your data in order to create something new, but rather change how that data is presented to you. On the other hand, pivots and filters do actually change your underlying data, and it's what we're gonna be talking about today in this video. All right, y'all, filter cells are super fun. Here I am in Hex in our previous Polyglot workflow project that we've been iterating on, and we are going to be adding our filters and pivot tables to this project. To add a new filter cell, we're gonna go down to the transform option and click on filter, and that's gonna create a brand new filter cell for us where we can choose our data source. Nothing that we haven't done before. So I'm gonna choose our orders per year data frame. Now we can start applying aggregations of different filters. So let's just start off with something simple. A simple layout of a filter goes column section where we choose our column. In the middle, we have our condition. And right now we have that set to greater than. And at the end, we have the value. So all together, this filter cells keep all the rows where the profit is greater than $150. And then we can see that our table size has gone from over 3,200 rows down to a cozy, comfortable 845 rows. And I said keep all rows because we can actually use this drop down right over here that says keep rows and change it to say remove rows. So we can say remove all the rows where the profit is greater than 150. And if I change that, we can see now that those 845 rows are no longer with us, RIP, and that we have now gone down to a comfortable 2300 rows. Now I'm gonna go back to keep rows because I do wanna keep them on my table and let's move on. Now we don't actually get to see the rows. So let's throw this filter data frame that we're actually gonna rename to say orders per year filtered and throw this into a table display. This is really an unmatched combo of cells if you ask me. Bam, look at that. Now we can actually see our data as we change these filters. So let's go ahead and actually like, let's just do this right now and see what happens to our data set. Oh, look at that. It changed in front of my eyes, magic, but not hex magic. <laughs> Back up in our filter, we are only using one condition to shapeshift our data set. But luckily for us, we are not limited to something so primitive, something so simple, something so easy. We can actually make use of multiple filters or filter groups. Adding a new filter to our cell, we should see a new challenger appear, which is this and right here. Now, for those of us who have been programming for a while, this should look pretty familiar to you because this is just a simple logical operator. And once we add a second filter, now the cell has two conditions to account for. So it's not just thinking like, oh, what should I do with the rows if the profit is it greater than 150? What if they ask me how many orders have been completed or what the order pr item price is? Like, what if they ask me all these questions? What am I gonna do? So that's why we have the logical operator. It tells the cell how to account for each condition. For example, all this filter is saying, keep all of the rows where the category is equal to dumplings or doodles. What this means is that the cell is gonna keep all the rows where the profit is greater than 150 and it's gonna keep all the rows where the category is either dumplings or noodles. Or in contrast to and, we'll keep all the rows where at least one condition is true. So watch what happens to our row count as I change our filter from and over to or. 
a row count jumped from around 700 rows to almost 2,000. Yo, tell them why I dropped so much, though. Okay, I got you. Well, rather than saying keep all the rows where all conditions are true, it's finding rows where at least one condition is true. This means that if the filter finds a row where the profit is greater than 150 or the category is dumplings or noodles, it's gonna keep that row. And my cat's here. Tell him that the or statement can keep more than one row. All right, never mind. He's I'm gonna go ahead and keep this on and because I just like and better. That's just me. Personally, that's just me. You can keep on adding filters for as long as your heart desires. Look at this. You can add filters forever. Watch this. More filters, more filters, more filters, more filters, filter, 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 filter. As we add more and more filters, we only have this one logical operator to manage them all. Look at that. Just and and or, just chilling by itself, having to manage all these filters with no help. No help at all. Working overtime, on the weekends too, with zero pay. For more complex filters, we might need a series of ands and ors. Or ors and ands. Or... Or ors and ors and ands and ors. <laughs> <laughs> to mitigate this problem and solve our existential crisis, we can use f Within a filter, you have the option to add a new filter group, which is almost like adding a filter cell within a filter cell. This is, this is fractal hex at play. Anyway, watch this. So if I go down here and I say add a filter group, we get a net brand new place to add a whole filter. Now, since we kind of already know the basics of a filter, I'm just gonna add one really quick. This filter is just saying that if we have more than 50 completed orders, keep those rows. And this filter removes like 700 rows from our table. That's crazy, but I'm not impressed. This is really no different than adding a brand new filter to the party. Let's go ahead and add another filter to our filter group and see what happens. All right, so now this very last filter says, keep all the rows where the text has shrimp in the name. Cause ugh, who doesn't love shrimp? I love shrimp so much, oh my gosh. Anyway, and now we can see that our row count has jumped from 30 up to 119 rows. So the final set of conditions for this entire filter cell goes a little something like, retain all rows where more than 50 orders were completed or the order contained shrimp. From this subset, also retain rows where the profit exceeded $150 and the category is either dumplings or noodles. So that was basically filter cells in a nutshell, but there are a few little small things that I kind of just want to quickly go over um, just because they're pretty cool and pretty nice to be aware of. The first thing is compiled view for filters. All right, so we've definitely seen compiled view before. We've seen them in SQL cells, but we also have the option to look at them in filter cells. And what this is gonna show us is just give us a look at the SQL code that is actually used to generate this filter. Let's see, actually, so if I were to go down here and like add another thing, let's just say category is equal to quick bytes. Now we get a brand new filter down here in our compiled view. On top of compiled view, you also have the option to duplicate your filter cells as code so if I come down to this three dot menu and click on duplicate as SQL the SQL the SQL code that we saw in the compiled view will get exported to our project as a SQL cell that we can use and we can even alter this query in any way that we want to and the last thing is even though we haven't talked about apps too much you can give users different levels of control of your filter cells in your app so for example if you want users to have full control over your filter cells that is adding new filters new filter groups changing the conditionals changing which columns are being filtered on you can let them configure all parts of your filter cell or if you want them to just change the value in your filter cell, you can configure it to let them only edit the values of the filter cell. All right, so now that I filter my data, I kind of want to use it to show me the average profit that a menu item will bring in per month. But honestly, I think trying to plot all 12 months and then all 37 menu items is going to make our chart cell look really, really cluttered. And I don't want you to look at that. I don't want your eyes to burn and bleed and hurt and go in pain because of me. Now, a great way to visualize this actually isn't even with a chart at all. It's going to be with a pivot table. Now, a pivot table lets you summarize and rearrange the data in a larger table into a smaller, simplified subset, which is exactly what we want. Down here in hex, I'm gonna add a new transform cell and choose pivot. And now we have an empty pivot cell just waiting and fiending for a data source. Now, usually you wouldn't want to give into something like that, but I'm gonna sue this craving and give it our orders per year filtered data set that we created from uh, this cell up above. So this cell is only gonna have 119 rows in it, which is kind of small. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and just delete these last two filters. I'm gonna go ahead and delete those though. So now we can have 730 rows. And honestly, I kind of want more data than that. So I'm just gonna delete this last filter right here and just have, you know what? 
I'm not even gonna use our filter data set. <laughs> okay, now for others, feel free to use your filter data set. I'm just, I just wanna show an example with lots of data rather than having to have that limited subset. With a pivot table, all we have to do really is just choose what the rows, the columns, and the values are going to be. Now, since I want to see monthly data, I'm gonna set my order month as my columns, just like that. And now we can see each distinct month as its own column in our table. So we're getting somewhere, we're getting somewhere, it's looking good. For each month, what I wanna see for my values is the average profit. So I'm gonna choose profit as my values, drop that in there, and I'm gonna choose my average option. And now we get a nice table of the average profit per month. But we're not quite there yet, and this is basically just like a glorified group by statement. I'm not even gonna lie to you, this is really just a group by statement. What I really wanna show is the average profit per month per menu item. So I'm gonna set my menu item as my rows, and bam look at that we have the order month going across our columns we have our menu item going down the rows we have a cross section cross section where the month and the item name meet and we have the average price the average profit for the barbecue pork bio was 106 dollars and then we can see that for all of our other data right here so this is pretty dope we have a fully pivoted and let's have to config we have a fully pivoted data set now that we pivoted our data your next valid question may be how can i use my pivot results in downstream cells unlike most output data frames that we get from cells like this we can now actually query this pivot result directly in a sql cell but you can duplicate the entire pivot cell as SQL and Python. And what this is gonna do is give you two cells. One cell is going to be just a pure SQL, which was used to create this pivot table. And you can see that this is kind of just like the group by, it literally is just like the results of a group by, which is our orders per year aggregated, keep that in mind. But let's say I just wanted to get my pivot results as is in Python. We have two attributes to use in Python. The first one is, let's actually just get our pivot results. The first option is to use the dot pivoted attribute. And what this is gonna do is return to you a data frame that looks exactly as the pivot table that we have right here. Other than the pivoted attribute, we also have the dot aggregated, which is gonna be just like that group by statement that we had from our SQL output. And there you go. You made it through another video and I applaud you for being here with me. I applaud you. This is for you. Now, did you know that honey never goes bad? Well, if you didn't, some other things to keep in your mind are no code cells in hex allow you to achieve similar results as writing code without actually writing any code at all. Filter cells allow you to change your data based on some conditions and you can build up more and more complex filters with groups. And lastly, pivot tables allow you to summarize and rearrange your data, making it easier to visualize and just understand complex data sets. Now, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video as we only have one more video left in the series. You're almost there, you're almost done, you're almost a hex master. You probably already are a master at this point. Now, in honor of today's video, comment down below with one of the most unfiltered things you guys have ever said. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.